So today I'd like to introduce Dr. Melissa Curry. Dr. Curry is a professor of pediatrics and chief of the Norton Children's Pediatric Protection Specialist and medical director of the COSAIR Charities Division of Pediatric Forensic Medicine. Dr. Curry received her medical degree from the University of Louisville School of Medicine and completed her residency in pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin. The subspecialty of child abuse has evolved during her career and Dr. Curry became board certified in child abuse pediatrics in 2009 when the examination was first offered. She has essentially created the Division of Pediatric Forensic Medicine at Norton Children's Hospital and the University of Louisville, which now contains multiple attendings, nurse practitioners, nurses, and even a fellowship program. She sits on the legislated Kentucky Child Fatality Review Panel and provides training about recognition, intervention, investigation, and prosecution of child maltreatment to a wide variety of academic and professional audiences. She is also a founding member of the Face It Movement, which is a multidisciplinary community action group that is committed to ending child maltreatment in Kentucky over the next decade. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Curry and I'll turn it over to you today. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald, for that kind introduction. And hello, everyone. We are going to be learning today about understanding abusive uh, head trauma, pediatric abusive head trauma. And I will go ahead and just dive right in. Uh, if my slides will advance, give me one moment here. There we go. Um, today we are going to define and describe abusive head trauma and its associated injuries. We're going to review statistics about pediatric abusive head trauma, and we're going to talk some about the medical evaluation and follow-up of a patient with abusive head trauma. So to start, um, I think that it's helpful to understand why we no longer use the terminology shaken baby syndrome. Uh, since about 2009, we have been using terminology abusive head trauma in the medical field, and many other professionals have adopted that terminology as well. First, um, it's because this is not a phenomenon that's limited to just babies. It's seen regularly in children who are older toddlers or even um, younger school age children. Um, and so consequently, we don't want to have a name for this um, diagnosis that artificially restricts the age group of patients that could be victims. Also, we know from decades of research now that often the mechanism of injury for abusive head trauma is not limited to shaking alone. While shaking is clearly the most common um, mechanism and is likely involved in most all of the cases, um, some, um, but not all cases, involve impact and other mechanisms as well. Abusive head trauma is the most common cause of morbid morbidity and mortality in um, physical child abuse, and that's important to understand. Um, it usually occurs in children younger than one year of age, but as I mentioned on the last slide, older children can be victims as well. And this is the most common cause of death from brain injury in children less than one year of age. And I think that that sometimes comes as a surprise to folks who might guess that um, household falls or ca car accidents um, or similar accidental mechanisms would be the most common cause of brain injury in our youngest um, infants. And that is not the case, unfortunately. So this is a key idea that will kind of be woven throughout the presentation today. And I think it's helpful to understand. And that is that it is very rare for a child to die or to be permanently disabled from maltreatment the very first time they're abused or neglected. This tends to be a pattern of behavior that escalates over time as opposed to a one-off event. And I, I think that that's really important, especially when it comes to our um, recognition and intervention in child maltreatment. Here in Kentucky, on average, we have about 50 children die under circumstances of maltreatment each year. Um, and on average, about almost 90 children are involved in near fatal incidents each year. And a near fatality is actually defined at the federal level. Um, and we use that same definition here. And that is an act which as certified by a physician 
results in a child being in serious or critical condition um, due to alleged maltreatment. And for the past few years, um, Kentucky has had the um, unlucky distinction um, of having the highest child victimization rate in the United States. So what is abusive head trauma exactly? Well, it's brain injury. Um, and again, it can involve shaking, impact, or both. The most common injury that we see in association with the brain injury is subdural hematoma, and we can see that on a CT scan. We can see retinal hemorrhages in the backs of the eyes. We can see scalp bruising or skull fracture if there has been impact involved. But again, it's the injury to the brain tissue itself that causes the death and disability in these infants. In babies, the most common trigger is crying, um, and in toddlers, um, it, probably the most common trigger is toilet training accidents. Um, and again, this is not typically a one-time event. In more than half of our victims of abusive head trauma, there's evidence of prior injury. So shaking can cause injury by stretching and, and damaging the bridging veins that are exiting the surface of the brain cortex here and emptying, draining the blood into this structure in the midline, which is called the superior sagittal sinus. And this basically serves as a drainage ditch for the blood coming from the brain um, to be pumped uh, or to flow to the heart to then be pumped to the lungs. And as these little um, veins, um, bridging veins, exit the surface of the brain, the brain is violently being shaken back and forth while this sinus is actually permanently fixed or attached to the inside of the skull. And so consequently, those little bridging veins um, get torn and they bleed in the space underneath the dura. So that is where the term subdural comes from is that it's underneath sub the dura. Um, and again, subdural bleeding is most often initially um, detected on CT scan. Um, we follow up all abnormal CT scans with MRI, and we do have um, a sizable number of cases that are detectable only on MRI. And so we have to have um, a pretty low index of suspicion um, in order to obtain those MRIs, which show us more detail um, and, and can detect more subtle subdural hemorrhages and um, parenchymal brain injury. So this statement was issued by the American Academy of Pediatrics back in 2001. So it's 20 years old now, and the AAP still stands by this statement, um, although we don't call it shaken baby syndrome anymore. And that is that the act of shaking leading to shaken baby syndrome is so violent that individuals observing it would recognize it as dangerous and likely to kill the child. I think this is a really helpful statement to help us understand the amount of violence that's involved. This is not um, something that occurs if a baby's head isn't adequately supported while holding them or by bouncing them on our knee or even tossing them in the air to play airplane. Um, these are violent um, acts that are causing um, the brain injury and subdural hemorrhage that we see in abusive head trauma. There are associated injuries as well. Um, I've already mentioned the retinal hemorrhages and skull fractures, but we can see rib fractures and really we can see fractures of any bone in the body. Um, sometimes we see bruising, sometimes we see abdominal injury, um, but commonly we will see nothing. So often these babies look completely normal on the outside. Um, aside from their neurological dysfunction. Um, and so again, we have to have a low uh, or a high index of suspicion, a low threshold for a workup for these children. So um, the signs and symptoms can be vague and easily mistaken for more benign problems. And we're gonna talk in a minute about how these children often present. Um, but one thing that is helpful to understand is that this is a diagnosis that's sometimes missed or misdiagnosed by healthcare professionals because it's frankly not an easy diagnosis to make, particularly in the more subtle injuries. So 
We sometimes identify abusive head trauma in infants who present with bruises, um, uh, enlarging head. So if the head circumference is enlarging out of proportion to the growth of the um, length and weight of the body, um, that can be a red flag and can be an indication to do some outpatient imaging. Uh, vomiting in the absence of diarrhea, particularly when it's persistent um, and not consistent with a typical reflux um, or viral illness sort of picture. Um, we certainly don't advocate for doing head CTs in every child that presents with persistent vomiting, but it certainly needs to be on the differential diagnosis that the vomiting is being um, created by increased intracranial pressure um, as opposed to a GI um, process. Um, sometimes babies present with extreme irritability or fussiness, or they're being described as colicky, whereas that they weren't colicky before their injury. Um, sometimes they present as lethargic um, or sleepy, poorly responsive or seeming spaced out. And then again, um, seizures um, can be a presenting sign. Sudden limpness or loss of tone, uh, breathing difficulty, gasping for breath, or just complete cessation of breathing. Um, the brief resolved unexplained event. So what we now call the brewy that used to be called the alti um, is oftentimes, certainly not always, but oftentimes the symptoms that are being detected from the brief resolved unexplained event are the concussion symptoms um, that we are seeing as a result of the injury to the brain. And just like the football player who can be concussed on the field and lose consciousness, they can wake, babies can wake back up from their concussion and seem otherwise okay, um, just as we see with the brewery. Um, sometimes abusive head trauma is found as an incidental finding, meaning that it's an injury that otherwise wouldn't have been suspected from the physical examination or history, but it is found because, for example, the child has head imaging for some other reason. Um, bright red blood from the mouth of infants, um, that is um, a red flag and oftentimes is a result of a torn frenulum or sometimes from oral pharyngeal trauma um, or even esophageal trauma that is inflicted. Um, and then of course the torn frenulum on exam. So one of the things that we're gonna spend quite a bit of time here on is um, bruising, talking about the kinds of bruising that cause us to be concerned for inflicted injury. And there is a clinical decision rule that was actually developed here in Louisville originally um, and is now being used internationally um, as a way to distinguish um, bruises that are concerning for maltreatment from bruises that are more typical from accidental injury. And that is now called the 10-4 faces P bruising rule. Now you may have heard of the 10-4 bruising rule in the past, and there was recently um, a study and a paper published uh, this year um, that expanded the bruising clinical decision rule to include the faces P part. And I'm gonna go through um, all of those components here, but here is um, the first part of the rule. Um, any bruising of the torso, ears, or neck, so that's where you get the T-E-N in a child four years of age or younger, or any bruising anywhere in an infant who is not independently mobile or less than 4.99 months. So that number four comes up again when we're talking about the babies as well. And you can see as an example here, um, this is an example of torso bruising. So the torso includes the buttocks, the genitalia, the belly, the back, the chest, um, and uh, uh, up to the neck. Um, and here you can see torso bruising on this young child who has multiple parallel linear contusions that are consistent with multiple overlapping blows with an open hand. Um, this is clearly diagnostic of inflicted child physical abuse. Um, in this next example, you can see an example of ear bruising. You can see the purple red discoloration down in the crevices of the ear, and you can also see a little bit of faint bruising on the side of the cheek. Um, this is um, highly specific for inflicted injury, especially in a non-mobile infant. 
Um, and so ear bruising should always get our attention um, when it comes to child maltreatment. And then this is an example of neck bruising. You can see some torso bruising down here as well on this child, but this um, kind of ovoid um, purple brown contusion is on um, the neck or the angle of the jaw, um, depending on your perspective. Um, and that is a really ominous location for bruising. Um, in my um, years of doing this so far, um, I have yet to see bruising to the angle of the jaw that was accidental. Um, I'm sure that it uh, can and does happen. Uh, it's just not something that I've seen yet uh, in my practice. So that's the 10-4 component uh, of the bruising rule. And then there's also FACES P. So FACES P stands for frenulum, angle of the jaw, cheek, meaning the soft portion of the cheek, eyelids, um, S is, I'm uh, completely drawing a blank, subconjunctiva, sorry, my um, Zoom projection was covering up my cheat sheet there, uh, subconjunctiva, and then P is for patterned injury. And so here are some examples that I'll try to go through briefly um, that just demonstrate how the 10-4 faces P bruising rule can help um, help us detect uh, inflicted injury in children. Um, so this was a nine month old baby girl who was brought to the emergency department after um, mother felt that she just wasn't acting herself and had this bruise on her belly after being in the care of a new caregiver. Um, this baby was alert and looked relatively good on physical exam, had a nice soft belly exam with no masses. Um, and um, was really overall clinically doing very well. But since she had a bruise on the torso, and in this case, um, she was a non-mobile infant, um, she deserved the full um, evaluation for occult injury. And that included a skeletal survey, a head CT, and screening abdominal trauma labs. And in her case, it was her trauma labs that came back highly abnormal with liver enzymes in the thousands. And that bought her an abdominal CT, which revealed a grade three liver laceration. So multiple individuals had examined this child's belly. None of us were able to detect any tenderness or discomfort or mass, um, yet she had what was a potentially life-threatening injury inside her belly. Um, so that's an example of how even a one single subtle bruise um, can be evidence of serious injury going on um, inside. The child on the right here was a victim of um, uh, of abuse because he was assaulted in the course of a domestic violence incident between his parents. Um, a neighbor overheard the babies crying and the parents yelling. Uh, I apologize for the dog barking in the background. Um, and a neighbor called 911. And when they arrived at the apartment, this baby was um, being described by parents as napping. However, what he actually was, was unconscious. Um, and so the social worker who did the welfare check on this baby did a wonderful job by turning on the lights and undressing the baby. And she was able to see all of this bruising um, on the belly here. Um, and uh, this baby, again, wasn't waking up despite having the lights turned on and the clothes removed and uh, was transported to the children's hospital by ambulance um, where he was found to have a duodenal hematoma, a liver laceration, um, as well as multiple fractures. Thankfully, his brain was okay. Um, he required emergency surgery, multiple blood transfusions and did survive, thankfully. Here are several examples of ear bruising. Um, you can see here on your left, um, this child has bruising to the posterior aspect of the ear involving the helix. Um, this child was picked up and thrown by his ear, so that's a crush injury. Um, this little girl um, was in the intensive care unit with a liver laceration um, and multiple other skin injuries, and you can see how her bruising um, actually appears somewhat reddish um, and could have been mistaken for rash, 
um, if it was not detected in, in the setting of multiple other injuries. And then here is some more subtle ear bruising. You can see some large petechia, small contusions on the inside um, of the ear here. Um, and you can also see just a very small, subtle contusion on the ear lobe as well. So those are examples of ear bruising. Neck bruising, um, admittedly the neck and the angle of the jaw portions of this clinical decision rule overlap somewhat and it really doesn't matter which you label it as, um, but this area of the body again is a very ominous um, location for bruising in children and we often will see it in association with abusive head trauma. This child on the left uh, was two years of age and presented with ultimately fatal abusive and abdominal trauma. And you can see the, the neck slash angle of jaw bruising there on him. And then this child on the right has a different um, pattern of neck bruising. Uh, he was taken to an urgent care um, early in the morning um, because mom was concerned he had an ear infection because he was fussy. Um, the nurse practitioner asked about the bruising. Mom thought it was because he had slept on a Lego in his crib the night before. Uh, police and CPS were involved and ultimately mom's boyfriend admitted to um, strangling the child until the child passed out. And so these are the kinds of bruises we can sometimes see with strangulation. Uh, and thankfully this child uh, woke back up uh, because that is not always the case. And then from TEN, the last part is four um, before we go into the faces component, and that's any bruising anywhere on an infant who is not yet independently mobile. Um, these are both pictures of very subtle bruising on very young infants. The one on the left was six weeks old. The one on the right was four months old. Uh, in both infants, the infant otherwise presented completely well. Both were seen at the pediatrician for a well child exam and because of the bruising were sent to the ER for a full evaluation. And both of these children were found to have multiple broken bones. So remember the rule that those who don't cruise rarely bruise. And then entering the faces P portion of the rule, you can see multiple examples of torn frenula here in these photographs. Here's a torn maxillary frenulum. Here's a torn uh, sublingual frenulum here and here, and then another maxillary frenulum that's torn is there as well. So we have to make sure, especially in our infants who are not yet mobile, to include examination of the frenula as part of our physical examination so that we can detect these injuries if they exist. Now, one um, point of caution about the frenulum tear, once um, children are old enough to become independently mobile, um, they can fall and hit their mouths on hard surfaces like the side of a coffee table, for example, um, or the, the bar in the, the crib railing um, in their crib if they're jumping up and down in the morning and hit their mouths. So that can occur, the maxillary um, frenulum tear can occur accidentally um, once children are mobile and active. Here's another example of a completely avulsed frenulum. Uh, and that incidentally is, those are the thumbs of mom. Uh, that is why they are not gloved. I just wanted to point that out. And then again, we have angle of the jaw bruising. Um, so again, this tends to over overlap a bit with the neck bruising, um, but all three of these children, the two on the bottom are the same child, um, are victims of abusive head trauma. And then we have the fleshy part of the cheek um, for the face's P. Um, anytime we see the soft portion of the cheek with bruising, um, like right here, um, that is concerning because there's no bony prominence underneath there. Um, and accidental bruises tend to occur over bony prominences. I'll tell you more about that here in just a moment. And then here are a couple of examples of eyelid bruising and then subconjunctival hemorrhage. So these are the hemorrhages that we see over the whites of the eye. Um, these can be common in the neonatal period as a result of the birth process, but after that they become significantly less common and are associated um, with inflicted injury. Um, you can see in this child on the right that there also is eyelid bruising as well. <laughs> 
And then finally, the P stands for patterned, and we will talk more about patterned injuries here in just a moment. This picture here is a cluster of four bruises kind of arranged in a semicircle. Um, this is an example of a fist or a punch mark. Um, so those bruises are from the knuckles of the fist that, um, that punched this child in the chest. So remember the 10-4 faces P rule. I won't read those to you again, but I think it's helpful to have one last slide to review those. And then we'll talk about patterned injuries here. Um, and I'll go through these relatively quickly. Um, slap marks, loop marks, um, other patterned injuries that can involve other household objects. Um, bite marks from adults and other children. So inflicted slap marks commonly are on the left side of the cheek. Um, they tend to slope somewhat downward or they can be perfectly horizontal, um, but they tend to slope from the temple sort of toward the tip of the chin. Um, they can involve the ear and they can extend back into the hairline as well. And the bruises are actually a negative impression of the open hand that has struck the face. And then um, this is an, a non-cartoon example of slap mark. This is the same child, same injury, just I think about a day apart um, that these pictures were taken. Um, and the history was that he ran into this beadboard wall here. Um, and thankfully, um, one of the nurses who saw him uh, in the doctor's office did not believe that history and made a report to CPS, which then involved our team and we were able to make the diagno diagnosis of inflicted injury. You can't run into or be hit with something rigid and end up with bruising that conforms to the contours of the body. So that wall would not have wrapped around this child's face in that manner. Um, nor would the child have been able to run into the wall um, with significant force to cause a negative impression from the wall. We tend to see these negative impressions from inflicted injuries, and we also can see them from other high energy mechanisms like children who are ejected from cars and who hit chain link fences, for example, and we can see a negative impression of the fence. Um, or sometimes the seatbelt is another example of, of how we can see negative impressions of objects um, accidentally. Here are more examples of inflicted slap marks. This is an example of one that's a little more horizontal. Um, this little girl here, I include her because she has darker skin pigmentation. And you can see that these um, bruises are much more subtle. Um, she has bruising under her eye as well. Um, they can be harder to see on children with darker skin, so we have to be um, particularly prudent and careful to turn on all of the ambient lighting in the room. And as you can see from this photograph, um, the bruises can be a little more tricky to photograph in kids with darker skin as well, um, because you get that flashback um, from the flash of the camera. So it's best to use um, bright ambient light and no flash when photographing children with darker skin. And this is the same picture you saw earlier, which shows multiple blows with an open hand. And this just describes everything that I've already said about slap marks. And we're moving on to loop marks. So loop marks are anytime something thin and flexible is bent over on itself and used to more or less whip a child. And so you will see the negative impression again you can see this when they're new, at least, you can see this double train track kind of appearance um, with loop marks that um, are either the edge of the belt or the cord or the charging cord, whatever the object was that was used to strike the child. Um, these are more examples of loop marks. This is actually from a wire coat hanger here on the top left. You can tell from that classic um, angle um, down here in the middle, um, you can see a belt mark and then this top right um, loop mark is from a cord. So this summarizes everything that I've already said about loop marks and we're moving on to adult bite marks. Um, you can see here that they look like opposing curvilinear bruises or sometimes people uh, will describe these as looking like parentheses. Um, sometimes they're in a perfect circle where they actually meet and aren't two separate bruises. It just depends on how the adult 
um, bit the child. Um, you can see here that an ABFO, American Board of Forensic Odontology ruler, is being used to help um, photograph the injury. And you can see that the, the ruler is being held in the same plane with the bite mark. And that's really important when photographing injuries is to make sure your size standard is not being held up away from the skin because that distorts the size. Here's another example of a bite mark. This one has um, either this is suction injury um, in the middle of this or it's crush injury um, to the soft tissue from the violence of the bite mark. And you can see that this bite mark um, has abrasions associated with it as well. Um, and then all of these are additional examples of bite marks. And you might notice that all of these involve the face um, of the children. Um, here's an example of one that looks almost perfectly circular. Um, this was an adult, all of these are inflicted adult bite marks where adults um, reported to us biting the children. So we know for sure that they aren't from other children. Um, yet you can see that this one is relatively small. A quarter is about one inch in diameter. And so you can see that this bite mark is just about the size of a quarter, um, which some might think would be too small for an adult, but indeed um, it was from an adult. So sometimes the adults just don't open their mouths very much and they can make the bite marks look smaller. And then this is a summary of everything I've said so far about bite marks. One thing that I didn't mention is that if we think the bite mark appears to be relatively fresh, meaning it hasn't started to fade and turn yellow yet, um, then we can consider swabbing it with the swabs from an evidence collection kit, and this can help identify perpetrator DNA. So it depends on the different um, scenarios and the exact history for the mark. Um, but when we see bite marks, um, we do take those very seriously as they are indicative of more sadistic abusers. And then the last patterned injury um, that I'll show you here, um, sorry about that, um, is what is sometimes called the Feldman sign. Um, so you can see bruising to both buttocks here on this young child, but you can see the linear component of the bruising here along the gluteal cleft. Um, and that linear um, component um, is from a crush injury from the child being struck with an open hand or some other object that crimps the edges of the gluteal cheeks together. So normal bruising on active mobile children um, tends to be on the front of the body over what we call bony prominences. Um, so foreheads, elbows, knees, and shins get the brunt of typical accidental injury in, in mobile children. So bruising is extremely rare in preambulatory infants. Um, it's a significant indicator of abuse if it fits into the 10-4 faces P clinical decision rule and must be reported to CPS and usually police. Um, and as or more importantly, it needs to be medically evaluated. Um, bruising continues to be the single most overlooked sign of child physical abuse. And remember the 10-4 faces P bruising rule. I'm going to quickly talk about the medical evaluation for abusive head trauma, just so that everyone is familiar with the types of studies we tend to order. Um, the head CT tends to be the frontline first test that is done when a child presents with symptoms of head injury, um, and we're looking for subdural bleeding or evidence of brain swelling. Any abnormal head CT gets an MRI of the brain and spinal cord. Um, this can demonstrate more subtle brain injury that a CT can miss as well as more subtle subdurals. We do a complete skeletal survey that is not the same thing as a baby gram. Um, it's a series of 21 different images and then we have to make sure that we follow that up with another skeletal survey with some limited images in 10 to 14 days because that can help highlight fractures that aren't yet visible because they're new. Um, we do eye exams on abnormal, uh, on children with abnormal head CTs to look for retinal hemorrhages. We do trauma and bleeding labs to screen for internal injury or evidence of bleeding disorder. And of course, we photograph all visible injuries um, and call DCBS and police immediately if abuse is suspected. 
from the outcome standpoint for abusive head trauma, we basically divide um, victims into um, thirds. Um, about a third of the children uh, will die as a result of their injuries. About a third of them will have moderate to severe permanent disability, and about a third of them will have subtle or no neurological deficits. When children do have disabilities, they can run the full spectrum um, of learning disabilities, emotional behavioral issues, speech language problems, vision, hearing problems, growth and hormone um, uh, problems due to pituitary injury, and then um, gross and fine motor issues as well. The most common triggering situation um, for abusive head trauma is a crying baby. And as I mentioned earlier, the second most common is in the toddler age uh, range with toilet training accidents. Feeding issues also are high on the list along with child's perceived misbehavior or punishment that has gotten out of control. Um, anything that causes caregiver stressors outside uh, from outside the home, like financial concerns or job loss, legal trouble, relationship problems are going to increase the risk for abusive head trauma. Family factors can include domestic or family violence, um, military deployments and redeployments, um, as I mentioned, unemployment or financial stressors, um, anything that causes isolation. So Pre-pandemic, um, I would talk about the isolation we sometimes see in, or that we often see in rural Kentucky, um, where individuals live, you know, sometimes miles from their closest neighbor. Um, but certainly since the pandemic, um, the isolation that was associated with quarantine um, certainly did not do children any favors as well as we did see an increase have seen an increase in child maltreatment as a result of the pandemic. And then finally, animal abuse is um, often seen in conjunction with child abuse. Um, characteristics of the caregivers can include substance use disorders, undiagnosed, untreated, or unstable mental illness, um, low self-esteem, and poor impulse control. And probably one of the single most common um, caregiver characteristics that we see are unrealistic expectations for the child's developmental level. So anything we can do as providers to help caregivers have more realistic expectations for a child's given developmental abilities um, is an important prevention tool um, that we should take advantage of. Um, certainly immature parents with poor coping skills, criminal history, CPS history, especially if prior children were removed from the care of the caregivers, um, and then caregivers who were abused as children are at increased risk at increased risk of becoming abusers themselves, although um, more likely than not, they will not become abusers. I think that's important to point out. So common examples of scenarios where we would see abusive head trauma is mom's boyfriend is newly unemployed and is now a full-time caregiver for her children. Um, babies crying interrupts intimate time, video games, or televised sports. We have um, had a number of victims of abuse of head trauma come in on Super Bowl Sunday and on Derby Day. Um, and also another scenario is caregiver is irritable or impaired due to drug or alcohol use disorder. And it's important for us to understand that our own uh, implicit biases can play a role in recognition and failure to recognize abuse of head trauma. There's good research that shows us that we are most likely to overlook abusive head trauma in white families, two-parent families, um, middle-class, well-educated parents, um, basically families that the medical provider perceives to be similar to our own, um, very young infants who may have a normal neurological exam and infants that have nonspecific symptoms only. Child characteristics can be any child under three years of age is at increased risk um, for abuse in general. Drug affected infants, those with either neonatal abstinence syndrome or what we now call neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome. Um, premature babies or those that had prolonged NICU stays. Um, the idea there is that the hospitalization at times can interfere with the early stages of bonding between caregivers and a baby, um, multiples, so twins, triplets, etc. cetera, um, colicky babies, those with physical developmental disability, and those with chronic illness.
And then I'll spend our last little bit of time here talking about prevention. Um, first of all, education about infant crying and normal development. So realistic expectations um, is really important and coping with crying and understanding that crying is not um, the baby's way of expressing that they don't like you, that it's usually the baby's way of communicating something important like hunger or discomfort or wet diaper or they're too cold or too hot etc. Um, oftentimes we will hear from perpetrator confessions that they perceived the infants crying to be uh, disapproval or um, evidence of the baby not liking the caregiver. Um, early recognition of abusive injuries and protective interventions, also very important for prevention, um, secondary prevention. So contrary to popular belief, um, this form of abuse is rarely a one-time event. It's more often the culmination of an ongoing escalation of violence against the child. And non-offending caregivers are often unaware of the abuse. So this is really important when we are interacting with families. Oftentimes the caregiver that brings the child for care does not actually know what happened to the child. And they are oftentimes repeating a history that they were told by another caregiver who didn't come to the hospital. And remember, bruising in babies is not normal. Um, and even if the history sounds plausible, we need to do the full evaluation for occult trauma anytime a non-mobile infant has bruising. Um, and then promoting healthy relationships and caregivers. So educating parents about choosing appropriate caregivers for their babies, educating young people about safe and healthy intimate relationships, um, and frankly, non-intimate relationships as well, um, helping them recognize toxic relationships and possessiveness um, when they're younger so that they're less likely to get into those relationships as adults. Um, drug alcohol and mental health treatment for um, caregivers who need it. We have a mandatory reporting law here in Kentucky, just as we do in every state in the United States, and ours is very broad. Um, it is any time a person has a reasonable suspicion that abuse, neglect, or dependency has occurred, we are required by law here in Kentucky to make the report. So here is the number for making the report, and there also is a website for professionals to make non-emergent reports, um, and that is actually the preferred method for a report um, if it's not an emergency. So don't be afraid to share what you've learned today with the other professionals at your workplace and in your social and family circles. You know, document signs and symptoms that you see, document things that caregivers say, um, take pictures of injuries or help establish a protocol in your organization for someone else to take pictures and document any information you receive um, when you have suspicions. When you report to CPS, you are allowed to remain anonymous, but that really hinders CPS's ability to investigate. It also takes away um, the credibility that we have as medical providers or healthcare professionals making a report. Um, so I strongly encourage anyone who is in healthcare, if you are making a report for a patient, um, identify yourself, explain that you're a healthcare professional that's taking care of the patient and what your concerns are. And that allows the CPS worker to follow up with you and ask additional questions. Um, they will want to know the child's identity, um, the person believed or responsible for the maltreatment, if that's known. If it's not known, that's okay. Um, the nature and extent of the maltreatment and where the child can be found now, again, if that is known. Um, be specific about your concerns and how certain you are that it's abuse. If you are sure that there are findings that are diagnostic, diagnostic of maltreatment, it's important to let the hotline know that right away. If you're worried for a child's life, say so. Um, and if you know of any siblings, particularly younger siblings, um, make sure to mention they're in the home so that they can be um, checked on and brought in for evaluation if that's um, indicated. So take home messages. Um, abusive head trauma is the most dangerous and deadly form of child physical abuse. Experience tells us that we often fail to recognize early warning signs and we therefore miss opportunities to intervene and prevent further harm to abused children. We all play a vital role in observation, documentation, and reporting, and the absence of risk factors is not the same as the absence of risk. Remember the 10-4 faces P bruising clinical decision rule? 
one thing I'm going to say about that that I forgot to say earlier is this is a tool to help us decide whether or not to do additional evaluation. The 10-4 faces P rule is not a diagnostic tool. So just because a child screens positive does not necessarily mean um, that they have been a victim of maltreatment. Long-term effects of abusive head trauma can vary from subtle learning and behavioral issues to complete dependence for all care and education of caregivers regarding techniques for soothing a crying infant and the dangers of shaking can be an effective prevention tool, as well as promoting healthy caregivers and relationships and early recognition and reporting. And with that, I will stop there um, and am available to take any questions you might have. All right, thank you, Melissa. A couple of questions. So in the outpatient setting where concerning bruising is noted for non-accidental trauma, what advice can you give on how to inform a parent or caregiver of concerns and the next steps, which are often less than pleasant for all involved, especially going to the ED or notifying CPS? So that is an excellent question and one that I get asked a lot. So the way that I approached this during the short time that I did general pediatrics, and, and I used this script um, a number of multiple times, um, is something along the lines of, you know, mom and dad, um, using their name, of course, if you know it, um, Johnny looks really good on exam today, um, and everything seems to be in order except for one thing, and that's this bruising. This bruising is actually very concerning, and believe it or not, um, it can be a sign of something pretty serious. So because of that, I'm going to ask that you take him to the emergency department. I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to drive 100 miles an hour, um, but I'd prefer you not go home and pack a bag either. I'm going to call the emergency department, let them know that you're on the way, and they're going to do some additional testing, um, and then we'll be in touch from there. So if you notice from that little blurb, I never said child abuse. I never even said trauma. I just said that it was a sign of something serious, which is a truthful answer because oftentimes that, maybe not often, but sometimes the bruising is a sign of ITP or some other bleeding disorder or some other serious illness like leukemia. Um, so that child needs to be checked for all of those things. Okay. And do you ever have trouble with insurance paying for kind of all these abusive workups? Um, not that we hear much about, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, so I want to make sure to put that qualifier on there. Um, for the most part, um, insurance covers this workup the same way it covers the workup for cancer or anything else that's a serious illness. Um, so that is not generally um, a barrier in, in situations that we've been told about. Okay. Do police need to be contacted immediately if abusive head trauma is suspected? along with CPS or only after further investigation by the medical team? That's a great question as well. I think at, at whatever stage you feel confident that a crime has been committed, that is when police need to be notified. And I, historically, um, we have relied on CPS to notify police. That's probably not the safest approach anymore, as much stress as uh, is on the CPS system right now. So we're trying to be better about um, concurrently notifying both police and CPS. Now, if we are not sure of the diagnosis or we think there's a very reasonable chance that there is an alternative explanation, then it is perfectly acceptable to hold off on notifying police um, until that's more clear. Our team can help make that decision as well. Okay. And how do you know if a bite was done by a child? A parent mm -hmm. told me the child did it, a bite on the arm. Do I send all these to the emergency room? No, you don't have to send them all to the emergency room, and it can be very tricky and, and frankly impossible to know if a bite mark is from a child. I think that if that history is, off, is offered openly and readily, and it's not a bite mark on a, a young baby, um, then that can be accepted at face value. If there are other indicia of abuse, you know, a history of unusual bruising or broken bones or 
you're aware of domestic violence in the family, those are the things that might tip you into sending that child to the emergency department. But no, in general, children with bite marks where the history is that it's from another um, young child do not need to be sent to the emergency department. If you have questions and you aren't sure, call our team, please. We're on, on call 24-7, 365, and we can help you make that decision. Okay. And then can you give a recommendation when we as caregivers disagree with the CPS rule? Oh, that's a great question. So I think our team can um, help mediate that to some degree and help uh, everyone involved have more realistic expectations of one another. Um, we can also work our way up the chain. So oftentimes, if we don't agree um, with the CPS decision making, we will work our way, you know, to the supervisor, to the um, SRAA, that to you know, basically all the way up to contacts in Frankfurt if we need to. Um, and we have done that before um, successfully, and and have. Um, an established uh, way to do that. So please allow us to help um, when that happens. And you know, if it turns out that it that the CPS ruling is actually consistent with what our team would expect, we can help explain why um, so that you can feel better about um, you know the ultimate determination. Okay. And then lastly, this is uh, oh here's another one um, about uh, this is more of a comment. Um, can you remind people that they are supposed to report if there are any concerns to CPS? Many times, they maybe example, many times they say they sent to the ED, but um, there's not a report done. And that might be just, you know, the ED might have a different um, view of the entire issue, but uh, yeah. there's one caregiver. Yeah, I think that that's really important. And, you know, one thing that I'll point out about that is it's really important that if you have firsthand information, you should report yourself. Um, not, uh, you know, for example, if you're a nurse, um, it's best for you to make the call to CPS rather than have the doctor make the call if you have first informa firsthand information that you need to share with CPS. So we aren't actually fulfilling our mandatory reporting requirement by telling someone else in our workplace. Okay, that's good advice. Um, so I often find CPS doesn't provide any follow-up on reports. Should they or do they? Um, do they? Often not. And it's a direct result of how um, understaffed CPS is right now. Um, if you aren't aware through the news coverage, um, CPS is at an all-time staffing low. Um, and it is beyond a critical situation. Um, we have teams in Louisville, for example, that generally have between 17 and 25 investigators who have three and four investigators right now. So that just sort of gives you a sense. So consequently, a lot of that follow-up work is not happening um, because they're needing to prioritize the most important um, you know, activities for their workers to do. That doesn't mean you can't call for follow-up and you can also call our team. Often we are aware of, of the status of a case and can fill you in um, if we've been involved in the case. Okay, and is there any role of head ultrasound in abuse of head trauma? That's a great question. So yes and no. Certainly if you have an infant coming into the emergency department and you have point of care ultrasound um, and you want to use that as a screen before the child gets a head CT, that's acceptable. But it's important to understand that head ultrasound is nowhere near sensitive enough um, to be a, a independent, um, reliable test for screening for subdural hemorrhage. Um, so consequently, a CT scan or ultimately an MRI um, are, are indicated. Um, head ultrasound does not have a role as an independent screening modality for abuse of head trauma. Okay, and lastly, uh, there's a request that you share your phone number. Sure. Uh, <laughs> our office number is area code 502. 629-3099. Again, that's 502-629-3099. You can also reach us by calling the Norton Children's Hospital operator and ask for the child abuse person on call, and we can be reached 24-7-365. So if you need us immediately and you happen to get a voicemail at the office, which sometimes happens, call the operator and you can reach um, one of us that way.
All right, sounds great. Thanks for your all your information you shared today.